It's a hot and cloudy day in Adelaide, Australia. For the 16th and final time in 1988, 26 Formula One cars are set to race in a Grand Prix, this Sunday being on the Adelaide street circuit. And now in pole position then is Ayrton Senna. Next to him, his teammate Alain Prost. In third position on the grid is Nigel Mansell, the leading three and a half liter engine. Driver. This is also the final time a turbocharged engine would run in the back of a Formula One car until their return for 2014. As the lights go out, the McLarens of Ayrton Senna and Alain Prost lead from the front row. Five laps in, and the Ferrari of Gerhard Berger takes Senna, running in second place at the racetrack hairpin. Last year's winner has bullied his way past Ayrton Senna on that the third lap. And the Ten laps later, a determined Berger passes the leading Prost at the same corner for the race lead. The Austrian national was in an unfamiliar place at the head of the pack, but this was all by design. The red and white McLaren had taken all but one victory that season, and for the final race of the year, Ferrari was determined to end the turbo era in a blaze of glory. Thinking it better to close this chapter in the lead rather than the wake of the McLarens, Ferrari drivers had turned up the boost on their 1.5 liter turbo V6 engines to the maximum 2.5 bar. Sure that he was to run out of fuel or explode his engine before the 81 lap race distance was run, Gerhard Berger was determined to pull out the maximum gap on his dominant rivals before his race was run. Having moved three seconds ahead of Prost by lap 23, the Ferrari encountered the back markers of Stefano Modena and the infamous blocker Rene Arnoux. True to his reputation, Arnoux ignored the blue flags and turned into the leading Ferrari at the hairpin, spinning both cars out. This caused the Ligier of Arnoux to stall and Berger to suffer suspension damage that ended his race. Seconds later, the Honda engine machine of Alain Pross inherited the lead, which he would not lose for the remainder of the race. The checkered flag fell that day on another McLaren 1-2. And fittingly, the last turbocharged Grand Prix after a decade and more of these engines is dominated by Honda engines. Victory in the McLaren for Alain Prost. Second place there, Ayrton Senna in the McLaren Honda. We open on this scene because it was the end of one of the most dominant years in motorsport history. The 1988 season was controlled by the McLarens of Ayrton Senna and Alain Prost. The MP44, which even those unfamiliar with the chassis names of race cars will have heard of, had one of the most impressive runs in racing history, and we'll get into all the details of its reign later. The story of domination from the 1988 season is one that has been repeated time and again in motorsport. Not just in F1, but at Le Mans, IndyCar, in any other series where development is open, there always seem to be spans or occurrences where one team or driver is just blowing everyone out of the water. Maybe they have a secret weapon in their design, or just have hit their stride while others are hopelessly trying to catch up. One team rises to the top and stays there. The problem with these periods of domination at the top tiers of racing is that, at the time, it's not really great for the sport. No one likes tuning in to see the same couple of guys winning the race, especially when razor-thin competition is the cornerstone of these series. So the problem is that, while it makes for a great story in the future, and someone can make a podcast episode marveling at the most dominant cars in motorsport history, at the time, having one car win every race, or every year, can be super boring. Today on the show, we take a look at some of the most dominant runs in motorsport. And for the first time, we branch out from Formula 1 to have a look at endurance racing, as well as a classic IndyCar. At the end, we'll pose the question, are these periods of domination a problem that needs fixing, or is that just the way it is? This is Garage Easter Radio. Thanks for tuning in. Stood on it, 
everything, locked up his tyres, got the line, and he's back into second position on the last lap but one, and the French crowd aren't very happy. <laughs> Before we dive into individual cars and periods, let's review some statistics from the most dominant runs in Formula One. In researching material for this episode, one stat that was most relevant to my thinking was this. When a constructor wins a championship one year, how often do they then win the next year? This makes sense in the most recent times, as we've seen cost-cutting and static rule sets seem to create these three- to four-year periods of prolonged dominance. Think Ferrari in the early 2000s, Red Bull in the early 2010s, and now Mercedes in the new turbo era. Here's what we found. And keep in mind that these statistical techniques aren't as sophisticated as those as you might find on the F1 Metrics blog, which, by the way, is great to keep up with if you're a stats nerd, and was very helpful in researching this episode. From the beginning of the Constructors' Championship in 1958, which, by the way, was won by a British garagista team, Van Wall, there have been 15 champions crowned. Ferrari has the most wins to their name, with 16, followed by Williams with 9, and McLaren with 8. From 1959, the percentage of winners that also won the championship in the previous year has been 47%. So think about that. Each year, there has been about a half and half chance that the winning constructor will repeat. If you look at the seasons just from 1990 onward, you'll see that percentage jump to 64. Then looking forward from 2000, Almost three quarters of the time, 72%, a constructor repeats a championship. You can also take this further and see a three-peat constructors champion 21% of the time from 1960. That goes all the way up to 44% of the time since 2000. It's pretty amazing to see the data on repeat success in Formula One. As far as win percentages go, there have been six cars that have won more than 80% of the races in one year. Three of those were Mercedes from the new turbo area with the 2016 car winning 90% of all of its races, and the 2015 and 14 each winning 84% of the time. The Honda-powered MP44 of 1988 has the highest win percentage at 94%, and the Michael Schumacher-piloted F2002 and F2004 won 88 and 83% of races in their year. Those are pretty impressive statistics, but I know that listening to numbers can be hard to visualize and gets pretty dull quickly, so let's move on to something new. Something we haven't talked about yet on this show. The date is June 17, 2000. Outside the small city of Le Mans, France, three Audis cross the finish line at the Circuit de la Sarthe. Having driven 368 laps of the 13.5-kilometer circuit, drivers Tom Christensen, Frank Bila, and Emanuele Piro have begun an endurance racing dynasty that will last for the next 15 years. Audi entered endurance racing in 1999, while most other major automobile manufacturers were running to other series, some due to high costs, others due to flawed programs or lack of interest. Mercedes abandoned their sports car racing program after the failed CLR project to focus on DTM and their Formula One engines. BMW and Ferrari changed gears to work more on their Formula One campaigns, and a Porsche Le Mans prototype campaign was axed before it even got off the ground. Audi sport boss Wolfgang Ehrlich saw the opportunity with a wide-open prototype field, and with a new take on the R8 concept from the 1999 season, they began their domination with a 1-2-3 finish at the 2024 Hours of Le Mans. The Audi R8 would go on to win four of the next five 24-hour races, two more under the factory outfit, Audi Sport Team Joost, and two more with privateer teams racing in 2004 and 5. The 2003 winning Bentley Speed 8 should have an asterisk next to it as well, since it was powered by the same V8 turbo engines that were in the R8, and Team Yost had provided staff and drivers to the Bentley team for the 2003 season. With the close of the 2005 season, the Audi R8 had wrapped up five Le Mans victories, six ALMS victories, and a victory in the ELMS and the Le Mans Endurance Series. The key to its dominance for half a decade? Simply put, its adaptability and reliability. The R8 was praised by drivers for its balance and consistency on the racetrack. It had the pace to win at high-speed tracks like the Circuit de la Sarthe, as well as more technical tracks like Lime Rock Park and even street circuits. One of their innovations was the Hinterwagen, which featured a whole six-speed gearbox and rear subframe with preset suspension geometries and corner rating. 
These enabled the obsessively practiced Audi mechanics to complete a whole rear end swap in just under four minutes. That meant that even with a tiny restrictor limiting their engines and putting them 15 km an hour down on the Mulsan straight to the competitors, the R8 still prevailed over 24 hours. Seeing the writing on the wall with greater and greater restrictions set for the R8 machines, the Audi Sport team planned the launch of a new revolutionary race car for the 2006 season, the R10 TDI. Plans for this new concept were actually hatched back in 2002, when Audi engine head Ulrich Beretsky and other higher-ups met with ACO officials over a beer in Ingolstadt to talk about racing in the future. The idea came out that to move endurance racing forward and attract new manufacturers, a new direction needed to be taken, and that direction was diesel. At this point, every other Audi sold came with a diesel engine, and the marketing team needed to further promote its TDI program globally. The ACO wanted to promote responsible and useful technology through racing, and saw diesel as the right fit. Audi and the ACO worked to frame the equivalency rules for the coming TDI race car, and made sure that a diesel engine car could be in the running for the overall win at Le Mans. Ulrich Bretzky would be the first to admit that the rules gave an advantage to diesel engine cars. He's quoted as saying that any company looking to move into diesel would have to take an enormous risk, because making a diesel race engine is very different from making a gasoline race engine. In other words, you can't just adapt a road diesel engine for a race car. Instead, Audi designed and built the R10 TDI's 5.5 liter V12 from a blank sheet of paper. Like in the good old days, you see here's a camshaft, there are two cams underneath, these are the injection lines, this is the collector, the air collector, as the air is coming from the intercooler sitting here, the air is entering here through this air restrictor which limits the power it's going through. This turbocharger is driven by the exhaust gases with the energies coming out here. It's all very simple at the end of the day. And it was that simple engine that would dominate the 24 hours of Le Mans for the next three years. 2006 saw the first victory of a diesel-powered race car at Le Mans history, with a number 8 Audi completing a record 380 laps, four more than their petrol-powered competitors Pescarolo Sport. 2007 saw the entrance of a serious challenge to Audi's reign at Le Mans. Peugeot had entered the ring with its 908, which ran a similar 5.5-liter V12 diesel engine. After taking pole position at Le Mans and the first head-to-head -head between the two teams, a rivalry was born. In the race, both teams experienced problems with their cars, but the Audi was able to claim victory after finishing 369 laps, 10 more than the closest 908. The rivals met again in 2008, but Audi reigned supreme once again after tense final hours of the race. Ten years of endurance racing from 1999 to 2008, and an Audi had claimed victory at Le Mans eight times. There hadn't been such domination at the event since the Porsche glory years in the 70s. In the next six years, Audi would win five more times, only yielding victory to a Peugeot in 2009 and defending its legacy against the likes of Toyota and Porsche later on. The record of 13 wins in 15 years is absolutely unprecedented. The word domination is the only fitting way to describe it. And the amazing thing is that, in the moment, it didn't feel like domination. At least in the sense that watching a Mercedes dominated F1 in recent years, it can be quite boring knowing that the German national anthem is going to be played at the podium ceremony. Maybe it's the nature of endurance racing, but it always seemed that victory was a challenge for the Audi team, even though they ended up on top most of the time. There was always a new challenger, a new issue for them to conquer. Maybe it's because I only started watching in 2007, but it was always a joy to watch, and now we can look back and marvel at their accomplishment. It's so easy when you're doing it now. This next tale of domination has a shorter story to tell, but an interesting one nonetheless. We go further back in time into yet another racing series. It's the 1960s, and in the town of Speedway, Indiana, just outside of Indianapolis, the 500-mile race is run each year at the Brickyard. The Indy 500 was always prized as the ultimate test of cars, drivers, and innovation. The newest and most advanced technologies were put to the test at the Brickyard. Seat belts, magnesium wheels, superchargers, and low-profile tires were all first run at Indy. But as the 1960s wore on, less innovation was being tested there, as European racing series became the testbed for new technologies and concepts. Formula One was attracting the freshest innovators, with rear-engine cars and advanced aerodynamics coming into play for the 1960s, and then they were being imported from Europe each year to race at Indy. That was until 1967. As I recall, I mean, it, everything from, from the color of the car, from the promotion on the streets of Indianapolis, you know, said that 
that turbine engine was going to be an experiment more than it was a race. I mean, they were convinced that it was the latest and best thing going. The greatest innovation at Indy in a decade was a futuristic jet-engined turbo car. And we were able to talk to someone who was actually there at Indianapolis when the car ran. The STP Paxton turbo car was designed by Ken Wallace and Andy Granatelli. Yeah, he was. Andy Granatelli had STP, and STP was a, an oil treatment. I'm not sure how effective the oil treatment was, but his promotion of the product was second to none. Billboards, TV commercials, um, great big guy in a red jacket uh, is all I remember. Um, I'm not sure if the car was any good in the lead up, but the promotion was remarkable. The aluminum space frame was divided down a backbone. On the right side sat the driver, and on the left was a Pratt & Whitney ST6 gas turbine engine. That turbine engine produced 550 horsepower, driven through a single-speed transmission to all four wheels. The car was designed to run just in the 500. The turbine engine idled at 54% throttle, meaning the driver, Parnelli Jones, only had to lift off the brake to begin moving forward. The acceleration was different too, as there was about a three second delay from pushing the pedal to the engine responding. This meant that it would probably be pretty hard to pilot around a street circuit. The car also weighed 400 pounds more than the minimum weight requirement of 350 pounds, but that didn't matter so much. In the race, the car was a revelation. We sat in the first turn, up high enough that you could see all the way down the straightaway, which meant the pits, and the fourth turn, and then um, the right, the, the, the first turn was in front of you, there was the short chute, and then the second turn. So it might have been the best place to sit. As a 10-year-old, I've been hearing about the race for all of my life to that point. And what you heard about was that it was kind of a, it was sort, sort of a bar fight. I mean, uh, the, first, the first row would fight it out for position, and then they'd be on each other's tails for a long time. But as I recall in that race, before you know it, Pernelli Jones is out ahead and just swooshing by. I mean, in, in the third or fourth lap of the race, you realize that, you know, he had, he had a Zeppelin in a balloon race. When his car went by, the, the most unusual thing about it is that it didn't make any noise. I mean, you, you got the full exhaust and you had the full combustion engine sound as these cars would roar by by the dozen. He'd go swooshing by and you didn't hear anything. It was anticlimactic because it was, it was obviously so superior. The car accelerated around anyone, and so it was entirely different. It was, it was, um, it was a different enough design that it was, it was kind of positioned to ruin the race. So it, it, he was way ahead, and then you heard from the announcer across the track and, uh, and, and over these scratchy AM radio speakers that um, Pernelli Jones is slowing down. And they, they couldn't see why. There was no puff of smoke. There was no blown engine. But he started to slow. And he was about to, he was about to cruise to the, the end of the most boring race on earth as a result of his, his excellence um, or the superiority of the design. A $6 transmission bearing had caused Jones to pull the car over with just eight miles remaining in the race. And very often, someone will pull into the pitch and they realize their car is, for the most part, ruined. But what he did, and we saw it firsthand in the first turn, was he, he, he rounded the fourth turn and gradually slowed down, down the front straightaway, and he pulled in the grass on the inside of the first turn and just sat there. And it, no one knew what was going on. There was no in-car communication. He had just stopped. And at some point, I think it might have been Andretti, uh, you know, ripped by him. And, you know, the, the days of old went tearing by to win in the fashion they'd been accustomed to, to that point. It was a mystery, and it was a real letdown because it was, everyone thought, you know, they were looking at the future, but in fact, you know, it was an attempt at the future, <laughs> and um, it, was, it was something to behold. A turbine-engined car would run at the 500 again next year, this time with the Lotus chassis placing the turbine behind the driver. One month after the 67 race, the sanctioning body cut the allowable air intake for the turbine engine from 24 square inches to 16 square inches resulting in a huge reduction of power. Still, the slimmer and more aerodynamic Lotus 56 cars, piloted by Graham Hill and Joe Leonard, dominated the race once again. However, Hill had to drop out due to a thrown wheel, and Leonard was forced to retire a few laps before the finish due to a fuel pump failure. After the 68 season, the governing body regulated the turbine engines into the ground. 
For a moment, it looked as if the brickyard was going to be the hotspot for automotive innovation yet again. But, with the cars proving to be too overpowered for their time, they're relegated to retrospective pieces like this. To finish our tour of domination, I'd like to get back to Formula One. There have been a number of seasons that have been comprehensively won by one car, or a number of spans where a constructor has always been at the top of the championship. Let's have a quick rundown of a few different periods from recent memory. While Audis were winning at Le Mans in the early 2000s, Ferrari were on top in F1, snatching the Constructors' Championship back from the British privateer teams of Williams, McLaren, and Benetton, who had prevailed throughout the 90s, the Scuderia went on a six-year winning streak from 1999 to 2004. Poaching personnel from the British teams in the 90s, most importantly Ross Braun, and under the leadership of John Todd, Ferrari was revitalized. Their two greatest challengers were the F2002 and F2004. That was back when their chassis naming conventions made sense. Piloted by Michael Schumacher and Rubens Barrichello, 2002 and 2004 were a landslide for Ferrari. Given the continuous development and testing that Formula One teams did in this period, cars were often evolved over the course of several years rather than a clean sheet design each year. The F2002, with a chassis designed by Rory Byrne and the V10 engine from Paolo Martinelli, only started racing at the third round of the 2002 season. But from there, it went on to win all but the Monaco GP, where Schumacher missed out on the ever-crucial pole position due to an eye issue, finishing second in the race. Delaying the launch of the F2002 for two months allowed designers to perfect the new technologies in the car. It proved to be worth it, though, as the success from this new design came from a new, lighter transmission and revised engine layout that considerably lowered the center of gravity of the car. Titanium was used to construct the gearbox, resulting in a 15% weight reduction for that part. That improved the handling and freed up space for aerodynamic gains. The car also featured a brand new traction control system and a different exhaust layout that later allowed designers to use the hot gases to aerodynamic effect. While the F2002 was one of the most dominant cars Ferrari ever produced, the F2004 was one of the fastest. Up until this year, the 2004 Ferrari Challenger still held many race lap records, and in its time, that speed meant success, with the team scoring 12 pole positions and winning 15 of 18 races. All of that winning had Ferrari finish the season with 262 points, more than twice that of the second-placed BAR Honda team. For me, these cars are the stereotypical Formula One cars. The sharply angled engine cover, thick front nose with the wide and low rear wing, just standing still, they look fast. The F2004 owed much of its success to the revolutionary designs of the 2002, having been evolved over the years to be easier on the tires and increase rear downforce. The speed was owed largely to the Bridgestone tires developed in sync with the Ferrari team, but the tires also proved to be the Scuderia's Achilles heel. The following year, the team experienced a severe drop in performance, finishing third and only scoring one win, and even that was at the infamous 2005 U.S. Grand Prix. A regulation change had banned tire changes at pit stops, so one set of tires had to last an entire race distance. Bridgestone had botched the design and couldn't find a race tire compound that was both competitive and reliable, leaving the Constructors' Championship to the Michelin runners. Ferrari's domination was certainly impressive, and echoed recently by the Adrian Newey created Red Bull success from 2010 to 2013. But that pales in comparison to what's been accomplished in the contemporary turbo era by the teams from Brackley and Bricksworth, Mercedes. Since turbos have come back to F1 since 2014, a Mercedes car has been on pole 71 times, and has won 73 of 79 races. Only four times has neither car finished on the podium. This is such an immense record of domination, and since we're living in it now, I don't feel the need to elaborate so much. But what has made these cars so successful? Obviously, the Mercedes power unit is the best on the grid. Not only is it the most powerful, but from preseason testing in 2014 until now, the reliability is unparalleled. And with regulations imposing harsh penalties for engine replacements, long-term success is found in reliability. The chassis and aerodynamics have also proven superior over the years with the only challenge in 2017 arising from Ferrari and later Red Bull. Essentially, they have had the entire package, and this is why they've been so hard to top. Other years, a team may have had a dynamite chassis, but suffer on high-speed tracks, or vice versa, but Mercedes has clearly mastered the modern turbo era. But what about the old turbo era? 
Thinking back to where we began the episode, the last time a car dominated with a turbo engine, it was the MP44. Prost and Senna drove their McLarens to all but one race win in 1988. In the Italian Grand Prix, both McLarens were forced to retire. First Prost, who had an engine problem on lap 35, and then Senna, who retired with two laps to go after Williams damaged his rear suspension. The duo also claimed all but one pole position. At the end of that season, McLaren had amassed 199 points. That was 134 more than their next closest competitors, Ferrari. One of the best examples of the car's domination was at the San Marino Grand Prix. Both Prost and Senna qualified with a 1 minute and 27 second lap time, while no other driver in the field could top a 130. Nelson Piquet, with the same Honda engine in his Lotus, could only manage a 1 minute and 30 second lap. The downforce and acceleration from the McLarens was unmatched. In that race, the McLarens lapped every single driver in the field. And mind you, that was only the second Grand Prix of the year. The MP44 is a special looking car. The design is so simple and clean. With the turbo intakes in the side pods, there was no overhead air take, and the low, straight nose made it look lean and mean. The success of the MP44 can be owed to a number of things. For one, 1988 was the first season McLaren had acquired the Honda 1.5 liter V6 engines, having used a tag branded Porsche engine for a number of years, and produced around 675 horsepower in 88 with the new turbo pressure restrictions. It was also hugely reliable, with only one race engine failure for the team all year long. The MP44 was also one of the few brand new cars for the 1988 season. Other constructors opted to use their old machine from the 87 season in order to focus on the 1989 design. The low-line chassis concept was perfected by the MP44. With a short nose and low-line aerodynamic features, it allowed more air to get to the back and therefore more downforce to be produced by the rear wing of the car. It was also the first F1 car to put the driver in a recumbent driving position. While Prost complained of the unconventional driving position at first, the more he drove it, the more he got used to it. And of course now, the recumbent position is a standard in F1 cars. The MP44 marked a shift from the classic to modern F1, and certainly deserves all the fanfare it gets. So, to wrap up, let's return to the original question of this episode. Is it a problem that in open development racing series, there always seems to be a constructor or team that rises to the top and stays there? Certainly, for some series, that can be a bad thing, as having one team win all the time might stifle development of other competitors, push them to other series, or mean a loss in viewership. My opinion, though, is that domination is implicit in motorsport. If there is not the opportunity to be the best and stay the best, what's everyone doing here in the first place? Having a constantly changing state of technical motorsport rules forces the designers of these massively impressive machines to solve new problems while drivers master them on the track. Top tier racing series have always been a marriage of the people designing and building the cars and those driving them. Sometimes that means that one team will dominate, and if you ask me, that's all right. Do you have any thoughts on this? Should racing series be regulated more to keep competition razor thin? Should regulation be freed up? Let us know if you like. Tweet us at Garagista Radio. That's G-A-R-A-G-I-S-T-A Radio. And we're also on Instagram and post some neat graphics each week in relation to that week's episode. Give us a follow if you're looking for some fresh F1 content and are tired of those same old Maldonado memers on your Instagram feed. That's all for this week's episode. Next week, we're talking terms and conditions. We'll review some motorsport jargon, some that you may be familiar with, and some you may not. So if you want to get that right in your podcast feed, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you have the time, please rate us so we know what we're doing right and we know what we're doing wrong. See you then. Take care.